I want you to picture what it must have been like to be a 17 year old joining your brother and his best friend 4,000 plus miles away from home on a journey called the Marathon of Hope. Our guest is the younger brother of the iconic Terry Fox. And Daryl has had, as you can imagine, a lifelong history of involvement with the legacy uh, created by his brother. In 1990, Daryl became provincial director for the Terry Fox Foundation in British Columbia, moved to the national office in Toronto in 94. To date, the Terry Fox Foundation has raised over $800 million for cancer research worldwide. Today, Daryl serves on the Terry Fox Research Institute's board of directors. He's a senior advisor to the Institute. Uh, you've helped establish, Daryl, what, more than 60 partnerships across Canada, uh, bringing together more than 300 of the best and brightest researchers and clinicians uh, from top cancer care and research centers uh, and universities right across the country. Daryl, welcome, and thank you for joining us here on the Leadership Standard. My pleasure, and, and thank you for, for dating me, but also for, for putting me back on the road in 1980. It's, uh, as you know, Gare, I, I like to go back there. I, I live it, I breathe it every day, and I never, I never tire of it. So I look forward to spending some time with you. Well, exactly. And since we're live, especially on LinkedIn, we're really hoping that people who, you know, who are out there watching and listening, if you have questions, send them in uh, because our uh, team back in uh, Calgary at the Tech Canada offices are going to uh, relay them along. So I I'd like to start maybe, Daryl, from the beginning. It seems like a, a logical place to start the story. Um, and 143 days. 5,373 kilometers. Can you bring us back to the moment in the Fox household when you first heard? I, I don't know if there's a way you can do some time traveling with us, Daryl, <laughs> but I'm trying to find that moment in time in your living room or your kitchen, you know, your parents, Betty and Roly, and you're involved and when Terry comes home and tells you what he plans to do. Yeah, well, well at that, uh, that moment and, and that memory is very vivid. Um, it, um, you know, Terry, people don't realize that not only did he run 5,300 kilometers during the Marathon of Hope, he ran over 5,000 kilometers uh, preparing for, for the Marathon of Hope. So he was certainly prepared um, for the Marathon of Hope, but, um, but he had lied to his family. He, um, he told us that he was training for the Vancouver Marathon, yet he was running up to, you know, 12, 13 miles every day. And I sensed as a younger brother that there was something more in play. But, um, you know, the way Terry looked at it, he had to convince himself that he was capable of running across the country before he would share it with his, with his family. And it was actually the, a race in northern BC. It was called the Prince George to Boston Marathon, um, where Terry... Um, completed that distance it, it was there was a nine mile race and an 18 mile race and uh rick hansen was was running that weekend and um terry finished that race ran 18 miles he was in last place but i remember because we were up there doug Albert and i doug who you mentioned earlier who was with terry during the marathon of hope we were also running that weekend and i'll never forget the smile on terry's face when he crossed the finish line because to him it wasn't important where he finished, what place he was in, what was important was that he had finished. And it was that, um, that moment that convinced him that he was now ready to run across the country. So he came home <laughs> and he started with mom because he knew that would be the, the, t the, the toughest uh, uh, person to convince. And he, he told mom that I'm going to run across the country. Um, as any mother would, she hit uh, the roof about three or four times. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but she also realized that Terry was totally committed to it and, and she wasn't going to change his mind. So the rest of us, dad, and including myself, we just, we just said, when, like we knew the kind of person that Terry was that, uh, whenever he had a goal, whenever he said he was going to complete something, he did it and he did it to the best of his ability. So we were behind him right from the beginning. Now, now here he is in his early twenties, but I'm thinking you're growing up in the same house. 
Did you get a sense at what age, I think, Daryl, did you get a sense that your older brother, when he put his mind to something, it was come hell or high water, it was going to be accomplished? Yeah, it was always there, Gare, you know, the, 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 the determination, the finish, what you started. I think it's a Fox trait. I think we all have it, though Terry had the monopoly a little bit in terms of his determination, but it was, it was always there. But, but I would think Terry would say it was very, his goals were very selfish. Like it was, it was all intended for him, whether it was making that grade eight basketball team or ex excelling in school, which for Terry, it took time before he was a, a very good student. He had to really work at it. But again, it was all selfish, but it was cancer, you know, the, the being diagnosed with cancer that, that really changed his outlook and his position in, in terms of how he looked at life. Uh, but uh, certainly the, the de determined individual that was very prevalent during the Marathon of Hope was, was always there at a young age. I, and I think anyone listening or watching would want to know after that diagnosis and after Terry has to come face to face and, and let's face it, your entire family comes face to face with this diagnosis because it's not just happening to one person, is it, Daryl? I think that's something people don't understand is how it affects an entire family. But how does Terry go from what must have been just, you know, soul shattering to the determination to head to okay, I'm going to go to Newfoundland and, and, and embark on this incredible journey, April 12th, 1980. I, I, I really don't have an answer to, to, to that one. Like, I, you know, the, the, the day that Terry was diagnosed, um, you know, up until the moment that he was told he had cancer, he thought that he had a serious, you know, basketball injury. You know, he, he was not expecting it to be cancer. And, and, and he had never heard of the word cancer until he was told that he had the disease. We were all there that, that evening. Um, and I think Terry, you know, recognized that someone had to be strong in the family because we were all not dealing with the news very well. We were all crushed by it. We were, you know, I was bawling my eyes out and, and, and so was mom and, you know, Fred was struggling and so was Judy and dad and Doug was there too. And so Terry realized that, you know, someone had to step up and, and be strong here. So, that's that's just how he he looked at the situation he realized that he needed to to put up a, a strong front and you know he one of the first things he said when he was diagnosed with cancer was that you know I've always had to try my best to accomplish what I have to the age of 18 I'm just gonna have to you know pick it up a bit and try that much harder I don't know what cancer is again I haven't I never heard of the word until a few few minutes earlier but he promised himself and us those that were gathered that he would do his best to beat the disease. And that's how we approached cancer from that day forward. Like he, he learned from that, that, um, that uh, evening that uh, he would, he would hide the discomfort and pain from us because we weren't, <laughs> we weren't very good at, at coping with it. So from that day forward, Terry, we didn't, we never knew what Terry was going through when he, you know, 18 months of chemotherapy, when he was super sick and not well, but you always knew who, what he was experiencing from the stories that he shared of others in the cancer right. ward. You know, that's where you got an impact of, of the, the impact of the disease and how it, was, how it was changing Terry. So we're coming up to, as you are so acutely aware of the anniversary, April 12th, 1980. Back then, there was no internet. And long distance phone bills were through the roof, if you recall. Oh, I recall. <laughs> I'm trying to picture, Daryl, the long distance phone call that must have happened after Terry first dipped his toe in the water in St. John's, Newfoundland, and embarked on that first run, because it's what, four and a half, five hours time difference between Newfoundland and British Columbia. Can you bring us to that first phone call from that, from that day? Well, I, I, you know, I wasn't probably privy to to those calls, Gary. It, it, mum was the source. Mum was the 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 person communicating with with Terry, um, and 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 yeah, that was that was the means of communication, and 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 you know, calls were not easy that distance to make at that time, or finding a payphone to make the call. We didn't have guess no cell phones, no. <laughs> um, and and Newfoundland is is fairly fairly sparse as, as well. So 
So mom was anxious waiting by that. And she also had a day job too. She managed a card shop, but uh, so they had to, the, the, the calls had to be timed and, and, uh, but, you know, mom would disperse the information that she received um, from, from Terry. And uh, it, you know, he, he always kept a very positive front and, and shared, I mean, she was very careful in, in, in what he shared with, with mom and the family wanted, you know, mom to, to think that he was doing well, which he was for the most part. Mm-hmm. But, um, but it was, um, it was interesting times in terms of communication back then, that's for sure. Well, and and now fast forward us to or not totally fast forward, but take us through the journey. Because there's probably a couple of stories and, and you can see the van. Right with with there's Terry and Doug. Yeah. But you join in St. John, New Brunswick. What went into the thought process that said, okay, and mom, and how were mom and dad okay with 17-year-old Daryl going out <laughs> on the road in St. John, New Brunswick, when the Marathon of Hope, let's face it, was still in the very early stages? Very early stages. And, you know, when, when you look back to, to 1980, Terry was meticulous in his planning. Like he knew how many miles he had to run. He had made arrangements with four to, to, to have a van donated. He had gas vouchers, he had food vouchers, he had raised some money, but what he didn't plan for was living with Doug Allward 24 hours a day, you know, that living away from home. And it, it, you know, it it didn't take long before um, I think they realized that if someone else didn't join the marathon of hope, it, there might be a murder on the marathon of hope actually so it um it was close confines so um you know they they you know mom was was communicating with terry at that time and they had a discussion and you know who was available and you know i went by default i was the only one available um they didn't look at a resume i didn't have one i had no skills um but at that time i i had one thing and, and terry had an incredible sense of humor and i had one at that time i've lost it since but one of the reasons why I joined up with, with Terry was we had this, you know, I had this ability to make him laugh. And, um, you know, I, 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 that's what I drew on when I, when, when I joined up on May 31st was, I, you know, I knew that the days would be intense and long, but if there was an opportunity and, the intent, and Terry was ready for it, and that was key too. Like there were moments when you, you wouldn't, you had to read the situation to see if he was ready to, to relax. And if he was, I would be there to, to, to make, to have some fun. Is there a way you could describe the interior of that van? (laughs) I'm thinking with three young men, um, you know, I I think people might be curious to know Daryl, what that was like. Yeah, <laughs> I think you've, you've given a good picture already. <laughs> it, it wasn't it wasn't pretty, um, and, and um, yeah, there. So we had we found the van in two thousand and eight, and and Ford was kind enough to fully restore it. Well, one thing we didn't bring back was the smell. We did okay, not, <laughs> because it, it 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 did it had an odor from three young men, one of them running a marathon every day um it it did smell but we thought it was a it was a good defense mechanism because it kept people away <laughs> For, and terry needed his his private moments as well so um but uh, yeah it wasn't um it wasn't a pretty sight um but um the van was was really big was very important to terry um because he was comfortable with it it was it was this home it was his home away from home he knew mm-hmm. that bed he could sleep in that bed whereas you know um whenever as momentum built for the Marathon of Hope, we had donated accommodations uh, quite often. And I was always putting my hand up, please, I want a shower. I want a, I want a, I want a comfortable bed. But, but Terry, you know, very often would prefer to sleep in the van because again, he knew that bed and he, he could sleep in it. You know, and you, you just brought up the point about momentum, Daryl. What a lot of people fail to understand, I think, with Terry Fox and the Marathon of Hope and what you and Doug and Terry went on, like from day one in Newfoundland, there were no crowds, there there were no spectators, there was nothing. There was a lot of, and I don't know how many hundreds of very lonely, lonely miles, if, if, if you know what I mean. When did the momentum kick in and when did it hit you? Like, what was that, you know, moment where, wow, this thing is really 
catching fire and and people are really behind us canadians are really behind us well well, well from a distance uh, you know being back home in bc i think i actually thought that there i mean i guess because we were so connected to it you know we were we were hearing from terry on a regular basis and though the the crowds were small because the communities were small they were they were still supporting the marathon of hope for example port of basque the last community in newfoundland population 10,000 they raised ten thousand dollars like that's incredible and that's where terry came up with the idea of asking a dollar from every canadian because if port of pass can raise a dollar from every person why can't we see the same thing from across the country so from from a distance i i i thought there was momentum you know he was terry you talked about we talked earlier about communication he was calling radio stations you know he had set days of the week that he had to call um, you know, Pia Chandel, um, you know, and, and all the stations in BC to report back on how he was doing. So for, from my perspective, I thought there was momentum, but it, but it did, it certainly reached another level. And I think when it reached the other level was when we crossed the border into, into Ontario, like it just reached a completely different level from where it was previously. Um, and it had, it was both, it had both positive and, and, and negative, you know, because now Terry had all the profile and attention and people were giving more, but it also came with side effects because uh, um, everybody wanted a piece of him. Everybody wanted to hear his story. They don't want to hear from Doug or myself. They want to hear from Terry. So it, it uh, created some challenges and complications, which I don't think Terry anticipated. Right. And, and you, you know, in your own, in your own kind of way, you would at least relate, I would think, Daryl, to some degree, what like Beatlemania would have been about where you're just constantly in that bubble and hounded, right? How, how does someone navigate through that when the, when, when the fame is just instant and overwhelming? I don't know, but I think, you know, that's one of the, the things that I admire. I mean, there's so many things to admire about Terry, but that's what, one of the, the areas that I, I most admire about him is, you know, the Terry Fox that started the Marathon of Hope on April 12th was the same person who had to stop running on September 1st in Thunder Bay. He never changed. When fame and fortune was thrown his way, he somehow managed to maintain committed to, to the vision and why he was running. And he was quick to deflect. He, you know, one of, the, one of the drawbacks, challenges he had was, you know, all this attention was coming towards him and he despised it. You know, even, even though it was Terry was doing the running, he was the one that was drawing attention to himself. He was very uncomfortable with, with profile and recognition. I mean, to the point where he did hate it, he hated it. And he was very uncomfortable and he was quick to deflect it. He wanted the Marathon of Hope um, to be about team. You know, if you, again, if you've given a dollar, you are part of the Marathon of Hope. That was his leadership style. Um, and he was totally committed to it. But again, I think his ability to, to, um, to stay focused and grounded and never forget where he came from was something I have the utmost respect and admiration for in, in Terry. I can't help but think there's a lot of leadership lessons that you just distilled in that short answer. Daryl, if I was to ask you on a more personal level to this day, what is the thing that still makes you most proud to be Terry's brother? I, I think that would, that what I just, you know, his, his humbleness, you know, the, the, you know, and, and the fact that he said, don't, don't make the mistake I made. You know, I waited until something significant happened to me health-wise before I decided to add something very important to my life, and that is to give back, you know, and, and, and to also to see what I'm capable of. Like, I believe, you know, I believe when, in, in Terry's vision that anything is possible if you try. Limitations are really self-imposed. You know, I live that every day of my life. I mean, Terry's within me every day. And, um, you know, I, I don't like making excuses. They're easy to find. <laughs> There's reasons not to do something. There's always. Right. But I'm always focused on, on you know, Terry's vision and his um, approach that, um, you know, anything could, you can do anything you set your mind to. And that's, that's my focus. We're, we're all human. 
Daryl, and we all have moments that we're less than happy with and we demand a lot for ourselves. How do you deal with that? That, you know, there must be this, uh, uh, I'm just trying to think of, uh, I'm, knowing that that's part of your, you know, upbringing and, and life experience, how do you deal with that? I would think almost incredible burden of responsibility where you can't make it, make excuses. Um, I, I, you know, I think I feel, I feel blessed that I have Terry, as I said, he's, he's within me. So he's always, he's always my standard. He's always my benchmark. So I don't know what it's like not to have him here or close by to keep me, to keep me focused and to, you know, those, those challenging moments when we, uh, we, we are weak and we feel like giving in to, to something that an obstacle or a challenge, Terry's right there. (laughs) <laughs> he's right there telling me, you know, you can't, you can't do that. You, you have to overcome it. So, um, so, but it is, there is resp- definitely, there's huge responsibility here. I mean, and I'm, I'm, you know, I guess I'm like, <laughs> I'm a Fox. I'm hard on myself and I always feel there's, you know, you can do better. And that, that, that makes life very interesting. And, and knowing that, you know, you can always do a little better. And that's, that's, um, that's what I, that's what I try. I try, try like Terry, <laughs> you know, try to, try to, to, to one run one more step or, you know, it's, a, it's, it's all about goals and, and, but we also have to appreciate your accomplishments too. You know, we have raised $850 million for cancer research. That's pretty good. Mm. That's, not, that's not bad, but, but I, but we still have a goal. We still have to, we have a, to finish the marathon of hope we still have to find the answers to cancer so you know we're still digging away scratching away still adding distance to the miles terry's terry's run to get there so it's all about keeping keeping going daryl i, I want to ask you in a minute about uh the foundation and and the work that you're doing i uh, i found this quote uh that really i think you've heard probably 10,000 times, but it bears repeating for everybody else. Even if I don't finish, we need others to continue. It's got to keep going without me. Those words, I think, uh, not only speak to the power of the foundation, but the annual Terry Fox run. Describe what goes through your heart every September when it's time for the Terry Fox run and literally an entire nation rallies to continue what Terry started. So from start to finish, people are out there, ordinary Canadians are out there doing what they can, but just reflect a little bit, maybe share a little bit on your thoughts when that big day comes, like I say, like clockwork every September. Yeah. Well, first to the quote, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Yes, uh, ten thousand times probably. But actually, I was thinking of that quote just before we we connected today, and because you know I was thinking about how like Terry said that or words similar to that um, before he was diagnosed a, a second time with cancer in, in Thunder Bay, he kept speaking these words that even if I don't finish the marathon of hope, better continue without me. It's almost as if he knew. Like this is what I've always thought that there was something was down the road was going to happen to him. And he, he was in the process of passing the baton to, to everyone else, knowing the exchange was, was coming up. And that's, that's why, yeah, as you say, September is, is, is everything to me because it, it's, it's the extension of the Marathon of Hope. It's, it's Canadians and, and more than just Canadians, people around the world coming together and completing Terry's run. And that's what it's all about. Um, so, you know, he, he was successful in, in, in passing that baton and we continue to run in his name. And I, I you know, September can't come soon, soon enough and it, it, it ends too soon too. So it's, it's, but there's a bit of work that goes on getting there too, careful. Like it's, a, it's a major undertaking um, organizing, what, 700 Terry Fox runs. And then we have over 10,000 schools that uh, host Terry Fox events across the country at the end of September as well. I, I want to, and just to elaborate further on that point, Daryl, 
there are, I mean, for myself, we, we aren't, you and I aren't that far apart in age. And I vividly remember the marathon of hope when it went through my home province of New Brunswick and, and, and some of the newspaper and radio and TV coverage. And then of course, when it got to Toronto, it became this, you know, incredible thing downtown. Daryl Sippler, I think brought the Jersey. I never forgot things like that. You know, and I know there are entire generations that have have never heard the Terry Fox story. If seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds, and nine-year-olds were listening or watching right now, because maybe their parents or aunts and uncles will share this with them, what would you what would you share right now with those kids? Well, yeah, yeah. I always I always go go to Terry. Anything's anything is possible if you try. Uh, you're you know that there, there are they are the next generation. They're the ones that are going to be picking up that that baton. Um, and it's so cool. Like I, we have this opportunity. My, you know, older brother Fred is more active in in visiting schools. I, I, I visited thousands of schools or hundreds of schools, probably more likely over the years. And there's not a better feeling in the world than to to share the story and see the reaction to the story. And and the the, the children of today are engaged. They are, and they it's it's not 42 years ago to them. It's last week. They know that Terry is not with us, but to them, the story is still fresh and new. And, and that's so exciting. And, and our message to them is, you know, the, the simple message that we start off talking about Terry not being perfect, which he wasn't, and, not, and being very average in every way, which he was in terms of, you know, natural ability and, and from an, an educational perspective, he wasn't the brightest brightest kid, but look what he accomplished through hard work and determination. So that's the message that we, that we share. I, there's, so, there's so many kids out there, like I, I engage with, you know, quite a few children out there who are, who are raising money in Terry's name. And it's just so awesome to have that relationship with them. And a few of them carry the name, Terry's name, or their first name is Fox. And that's pretty cool too. Really enjoy that. Nothing happens, nothing good happens without hard work. What do you think the secret is to keeping this type of movement alive and relevant for literally decades and still decades to come. Well, I'm gonna be really biased here, but I, I think it's le it's leading with Terry. You know, as long as we we keep him first and, and foremost, and don't get distracted. Um, you know, he he's given us the the vision. He's given us the vision. He's given us values too, very very high end values. Um, and so, as long as we lead with him, I think we're gonna be okay. And I think we have proven to be okay, that we're still relevant, we're still out there. Um, if, we, if we get away, if we think we need to change for the purpose of change happening in the world today, I think we're gonna be, we're gonna be, we're gonna be in trouble. So, um, so that's how I think. <laughs> I may be wrong in that thinking, but I'm, I'm committed to, to that, to you know, leading with Terry's values and his, his vision. So pull the curtain back, Daryl, and tell us, share with everyone a little bit what goes on inside the Fox family, because you and, 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 and some of your siblings, people are getting older. We're all getting older, but you keep bringing that up. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, I'm par partly because I'm envious. You know, you've got hair and I don't. And, but anyway, but you know what I mean, Daryl? Um, what goes on with the next generation of foxes, the younger foxes, if you will, yeah. uh, that will have to run with this someday. Well, they're running with it now a little bit, Gare. I mean, that's what's, you know, like when there's, I mentioned Fred, my, and there's also Judy, the, the younger sister. So there were four in the family. Um, and and mom had to to jump on on board right away. Like she, she was a, a, a card store manager, and yet she had to take on this responsibility of um, you know nurturing and Terry's name and brand and and also being directly involved in the Terry Fox run. So, um, but that wasn't forced on us. There was, it's never been forced on any, <clears throat> excuse me on any of the family members. You mentioned how I joined in 1990, so I had, I had a decade away before I became involved. <clears throat> and that's how we are with the the next generation, as we call them, the next generation, the grandkids of Betty and Rolly Fox. So. Um, but now there, there are eight grandchildren and five of them are, are, are now engaged and they are members of the three identities that, that bear the Terry Fox name. There's the Terry Fox Foundation, 
the Terry Fox Research Institute, and the Terry Fox Center, which is responsible for the collection, the memorabilia. And um, so not all of them are, uh, there's five of eight, so not all of them are involved. Um, but uh, they've been, they've joined, uh, they've been members for, for going on three years now. And it, it's, it's actually been incredible. <laughs> you know, we, we meet every, at least, well, officially once a month, but there's usually reasons for us to, to have call Zoom meetings prior to, to that time. So we're constantly engaged and um, it's, it's, it's wonderful. It started off initially where just the older types were, were doing all the talking but now we're in the in transition where they're taking over and they're the ones that are leading the conversation. And that's what, what, um, that's what happened with mom and dad. And now mm -hmm. we're in the process of handing off because as you said, we're getting, we're getting older and transition has to happen. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll get off that uh, <laughs> aging topic and, and let's go back to your parents, Rolly and Betty. If, if they were watching our conversation right now and knowing what, what has evolved with the Terry Fox Foundation. How do you think Rolly and Betty would be feeling these days? Yeah, they're, I'm, you know, it's, 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 gosh, <laughs> don't bring up mom and dad. I mean, I have trouble enough with Terry and then you bring mom and dad into it. You know, I miss my mom and dad. I really miss mom because I, you know, I had a, a what I thought was a pretty good relationship and close relationship and she was an incredible mentor for me um and I just hope just like you know like I hope with Terry that, that that they're proud I think they are you know we learned from them so anything we're doing is based on 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 you know their what they shared with us um so but you know dad you know his dad was dad was hard because dad dad was diagnosed with lung cancer and passed away within two months of being diagnosed. So we had, we had to experience cancer twice in our family in our immediate family, that is. And it was really hard because again, as I spoke about, uh, about Terry, Terry, um, Terry made sure we weren't aware of, of the difficulty he was having with cancer. But with dad, it was completely different because we were the primary caregivers for him. So we witnessed it and, not, I didn't need any more motivation, but I certainly got it from, from seeing the impact of, of lung cancer on my dad. So, you know, there's a, there's still a lot of drive and, and determination within us as family members to, to give this disease a, a big kick where, it, where it needs to be kicked. And so that keeps us motivated and inspired. And I, I, I know mom and, and dad feel that we're, we're involved for the right reasons. It's all about, um, you know, finishing this marathon of hope that needs to be finished. Your brother, as you know, um, is one of the greatest Canadians of all time. There are multiple statues at different um, locations around the country. Uh, I heard you on a wonderful podcast you did with Mark Sutcliffe, where Terry's mission became yours. You had left the foundation for a while. I'm, I'm interested in learning, and I think our viewers and listeners would be interested knowing and knowing how you internalize it and made this your your own mission. Yeah. So, so I wasn't uh, I wasn't uh, directly involved with the foundation. Mom, mom picked up the baton in 1981, shortly after Terry passed away, and um, I just I I wasn't ready. Gare, I, I, I wasn't ready because, you know, I, I was a younger si sibling who had incredible respect and admiration for my older brother. You know, he, he, I thought he was invincible. Like I thought even up until the last day that Terry would bounce back. He wasn't going to die of cancer. Terry Fox is not going to die of cancer. That's not going to happen, but it did happen. And I just wasn't in a, and then uh, we, as you mentioned, all the euphoria around the marathon of hope and being around a rock star all the time, you know, that was a, a massive change for me. You know, mm -hmm. I still recall, you know, the day after Terry was forced to stop running, he was, mom and dad had flown out and they were traveling back in a Lear jet and our private jet and, and um, Doug Allward and I were on a, regular flight flying back like it was what's going on here um and I, you know that's how my life was for him for not months but years you know where I just I, I couldn't understand or accept the loss um 
but I found my way out of that really dark patch. And I'm, I'm really disappointed in myself because I wasted many good years feeling sorry for myself, basically. Um, and, um, and when I joined the foundation, I, but I wanted to join the foundation, you know, because I was ready and I could be comfortable being um, Carrie Fox's brother, which is who I am now. And I'm kind, I'm, I'm just fine with that. I'm okay with that. And I'm proud of that, Extreme, extremely proud. Um, I'm never gonna be Terry Fox. I have no aspirations to be Terry Fox, but I sure like being around him and sharing his story. And, and I'm pretty lucky to have that ability. You, uh, Daryl, received the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Medal on behalf of the family. On behalf of the when, family, yes. Right? <laughs> yes. When you, when you think about whether it's an award like that, an honor like that, when you see all these statues, like I say, that go from Newfoundland to British Columbia, what, wh how does that all land in your heart? Well, we we appreciate all the all the recognition, the honors, um, you know, and that that occupies a lot of our discussions from from time because the family is ultimately responsible for those activities. But we don't we don't um, that's not a mission of ours. Terry wasn't about recognition. Um, um, so it, it, it comes to us. We, we met, we obviously um, engage when, when proposals come our way, but we're not out there looking for them. So that gives what's out there that much more significance because there's not an identity behind making that happen. It's people, it's Canadians out there who want to still recognize Terry. And it's still happening. That's the crazy thing. 42 years later, there's still recognition. There's going to be a, a new a mural on 500 University Avenue in downtown Toronto this summer. I mean, that's so cool to see that. I mean, I think it's cool. Um, and um, so that, that makes me really proud and, and excited that people still see Terry's story as being very relevant and they want to keep putting it out there. Yeah, I think it's safe to say, Daryl, you and I can project into the future and see the 50th anniversary, the 100th anniversary. These are the types of things we're talking about. Very sensitive topic. Uh, your brother's statue, without getting into the details, was, shall we say, tampered with during some recent events in Ottawa. Uh, with great respect, I ask, when people do these types of things, um, how is that uh, looked upon by you and other members of the family and the foundation? Yeah, that's that's a difficult, challenging one for us, Gare, in, in that, you know, where we where we land and where we stay, and you've heard it over the last many minutes, is on what, what Terry's vision was. What was his mandate? Why did he run across the country? He ran across the country for one purpose only, to raise money to find a cure for cancer. So that's where we focus. That's where we are. So any other activities which would suggest that Terry had a different um, mandate, we just don't comment. We don't go there. Um, and we allow Terry Foxers, who have spoken for Terry for 42 years, to, to speak for him. Uh, because they know that that was his vision. It was all about raising money. And that's, that's where we will we'll stay until we don't need to have an annual run and we won't need to raise any more money. That's what we'll be doing. Tell us more about your day-to-day -day work, Daryl. Uh, the efforts you're doing, and you do them every day. There is no, I, I, I'm trying to picture what it must be like. There can't be a day when, when the story of your brother doesn't come up. The, every new person you would ever meet eventually finds out who you are but I know you're so focused on the work. Tell us more about the work. Yeah, the work, the work is everything. The, the, you know, it, it, we, we're multifaceted around here. Um, I am senior advisor at the Terry Fox Research Institute. So you know, the, the foundation is responsible for raising the money. The Terry Fox Research Institute is quite happy to spend it. <laughs> so, so we work with, as you indicated, we have many research partners ac across the country that we work with and we partner with. And that's what I'm so excited about right now is how, you know, Terry brought a nation together to raise money in 1980. Now we're bringing 
organizations together to partner. Instead of competing against each other, we're working together. Not only are we working together in terms of what we support in terms of research, we're actually, you know, in the process of working together to fundraise together. And I think the public would very much appreciate that. Um, I don't think we should be competing. I think we have common ground. We all want to eradicate cancer. And that's that's the vision that we have. And I, you know, and and I think Terry has this remarkable way of bringing people together. And that's what we're doing now. So it's um, it's always exciting work. Um, and we've had, we've it hasn't been a good go the last couple of years, Gary, in terms of, you know, COVID, we, we struggled because we have, you know, we've been talking about that, the annual run. We have one day every year to fundraise and we and come together. And we haven't been able to come together for two years, but yet Terry Foxers were incredible. We were, we were hurt pretty hard the first year, but last year we almost raised as much as we raised in 2019, which is pretty remarkable. We had to be creative. We had to go online more with, with, um, with the run, um, but uh, but again, Terry Foxes are pretty pretty impre impressive people, and we're pretty proud of what what happened over the last couple of years. Let's put in an early plug. What's the date for the Terry Fox Run in 2022, Daryl? Sunday, September 18th, number number uh, number 42. So hope you're hope you're all out. You know, uh, a standard question that we ask on the leadership standard in the context of everything we've talked about with your brother, the foundation, your parents. How does Daryl Fox define the word leadership? Yeah, well, I, I you know, I think we, we had a quick chat about this pre, pre this, uh, this, this conversation. And I, you know, I'm very, I'm not a leader. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a follower. So uh, I follow Terry. So um, I, I see leadership as you know, and it, it's 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 consistent with Terry's. Terry's Terry was not comfortable with being a leader too. He was an he was a you know if he had one of his former, um, you know, teachers speaking, they they'd be talking about what an introvert he was. You know, he he was very shy and 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 didn't like to engage in conversation. Um, neither do I. <laughs> But but I know that I know this one topic, this Terry Fox topic, and so I'm about bring. I, I believe in bringing people together. I think that's that we and you can be you can lead as a group, um, and that's what we we do. If 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 you've given a dollar, you are a part of the Terry Fox Foundation, or you're a part of our family, and that's how we treat people. Um, it's it, it, you know, and uh, I I think it, it again. I think it's it's kind of worked. And it's still working. So I'm going to continue to to follow follow Terry's lead with, with his vision, and I think we'll be just fine. I, I can't help but think, and it just struck me listening to you, that in this day and age where there's so much, shall we say, entitlement, or or there's polarization, uh, you know, so much uh, discord. Uh, and, and and let's face it, it's been a tough go with two years of the pandemic. I can't help but think the leadership a message and example of the Fox family is now more relevant than ever. Well, if you'd remove the family there, I would agree. <laughs> no, I agree. I, I agree. T Terry Fox um, is needed right now in this world. I really I really believe that um, because it, it is it is a world that is becoming more and more about entitlement and selfishness. And Terry's quite the opposite of that. And he needs to be even more prominent out there in this world, I think at this particular moment, before we go too far down the other way. Yeah, and I just, like I say, uh, Daryl, I think it, that's it, in so many ways beyond cancer research, I'm just forming the thoughts as we you know, have this conversation, but I'm thinking beyond the research and the good work that the uh, Institute does and, and, and the foundation, I'm thinking there's also maybe a message for uh, would-be leaders everywhere about what it really takes. Because the, let's face it, put it this way, when you and Terry and Doug were out there in New Brunswick and Newfoundland and Nova Scotia back in 1980, there was no such thing as helicopter parents or snowflakes or <laughs> any of that. And I just can't help but think there's a certain, shall we say, 
uh, grit that's been lost. And uh, I'm thinking your brother's story helps us remind, helps remind us of the need for that. I agree. No, I can't agree with you more. Maybe that's why we had, we've had some, some better years and we're, you know, we're recently like last year in light of the, the challenges that COVID place that maybe people are looking to Terry more or, or examples like him more to get us through. So the, I'm always looking at the positive and, and hopeful that we'll find our way through this. Let's, let's do a little uh, very quickly, Daryl, so people uh, get to know you even better up close and personal, shall we? Okay. <laughs> Here we go. We, com- we, we make this completely unscripted. So uh, if, uh, for example, you could go on a one-on-one dinner date with anyone, Dead or alive, who would it be? Oh boy! Oh, there's so many. Do I have to pick one? I, I, I'm, I'm almost. I would say Terry. I mean, there's Terry. There's Muhammad Ali. There's Bobby Orr. Um, I've had. I have a lot of admiration and respect for for Muhammad Ali. Um, Terry, because Terry liked him too, and so did my my dad. Was a big fan. I had the opportunity to meet him. Um, he signed a pair of Terry Fox shoes back in in 2007 and so and this is when he was advanced stages of of parkinson um but what what a remarkable even though his his communication was lacking what a what an incredible opportunity it was to to meet him uh because i think i I really admired his form of of leadership and i've always been a big fan of bobby or and daryl sittler too um because of uh, you know it's funny that terry gravitated to people who were similar to him who were humble you know, um, Bobby Orr is a, a very humble individual, humble athlete. Um, so was Daryl Sittler. And uh, so um, can I can I can I bring three people along? <laughs> <laughs> Be a hell of a dinner party, wouldn't it? Uh, let me ask you this. Your three all time favorite books. Oh, my gosh, I probably I'm, I'm reading. I hope I don't. Um, I don't uh, cause problems with how I pronounce his name, Ken Fillet right now. Okay. Um, the World's End. Um, so I, I would have to probably pick, uh, and then I'm reading a trilogy right now of his, and I'm forgetting the names of it, but uh, I would choose those three books. I'm midway through book two, and it, it's, um, it's incredible because it's, it's actually quite timely because it's, you know, the first book was based on the First World War. The second book is based on World War, World II. So I'm getting a really good history lesson in, in the process of reading these books. And it's kind of timely in light of what's happening in the Ukraine right now. Daryl, I want you to picture you're alone in your car. What do you think about the most? I'm getting on my bike. <laughs> I, I do. I have a, I have a fetish for, I used to run. Now I have a, a fetish for, for, for bikes. Um, I spend quite a bit of time thinking about our work. I have to admit, like I'm always, I'm always there. I, I can't get away from it. Um, and it's, and it's not a burden. It is not, it is a responsibility. I get it, but I'm always thinking about what we can, what, what we can do and, and further opportunities because we're not raising a dollar from every Canadian right now. We're not. And that's what Terry asked for in 1980. So we want to get back to that where, where we're raising is it 38, million people now in Canada, we're raising $38 million. We're mid twenties right now. So we have, so I'm always thinking about ways to, to increase funds raised. Other than the biking, what is your guilty pleasure? It, well, if my better half was, we celebrated anniversary number 29 yesterday. And if she was here, she, she would, she would say there, it's only the bike. That's all there is, is the bike, but it's, it's family, it's kids. You know, we have two, uh, 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 two adult children who mm-hmm. are still with us. So, you know, helping them, encouraging them, um, to find their way and in, in a very challenging time in terms of cost of living and, and how this world is. So I, I think children would probably family is very important to me. During these challenging times, we've all spent more time binge watching than we would care to admit. Do you have any binge recommendations that you want to share? Favorite series on Netflix or any other streaming service? (laughs) I we are we're not big TV watchers here. I I watch the news. Um, 
you know that to, I I need to 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 find out what's going on in the world. So it's all it, it's primary. I don't watch any series at all. Um, but if I do have time, I'll, I'll watch. Um, I'm I, I don't know. I'm going to get in real trouble for this. But it goes back to Bobby Orr. I'm a I'm a diehard Bruin fan, and I've I've had to die pretty hard <laughs> sometimes. Um, but I, I love watching Boston play. I love watching my Bruins. Well, there's a whole nation that would agree with you. And I'm thinking you must have been in a real predicament when the Bruins went to Vancouver to capture that Stanley Cup. You yeah. That's rocking a hard place for you, isn't it? Now, well, guess what my favorite, my second favorite team is Vancouver Canucks. Mom and I, we, we had season tickets throughout the late 80s and early 90s. And mom and I went to the games all the time. I was in, I couldn't, I couldn't lose in, in, you know, in, in 2011, I couldn't like, I was going to win either way. So it was a really good position to be in, but to just, maybe if I could elaborate a little bit, it was when mom was, was not well. And she, she would, she passed away, um, two days after game, game seven. So, you know, game seven was, I know this obviously very well was Wednesday and on Friday, she would pass away. I wasn't allowed to go watch hockey games with the family because <laughs> I was a Bruin fan. Like I was Bruin first, Vancouver second. So the only time I, when I was going to see mom in the hospice, it'd have to be after the game was over and everybody had left. And so the, that was, that was the last um, TV mom watched was game seven, Vancouver and, and Boston. Um, so it was, uh, it's pretty, pretty vivid, vivid memory for, for me, obviously. Well, I, you just suddenly, you brought me back through your mother's uh, memory to the days of, let me see, Orlan Kurtenbach. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> Dunk Wilson. Uh, who else were some of those? Don uh, Canucks, Don Lever, Harold Schnepps. Jo and, Jocelyn Guvermont. And King Richard Brodeur <laughs> and that unlikely Stanley Cup run when they had those yellow uniforms. Uh, before we wrap up, Daryl, let's talk about multi general, uh, multi multi generational leadership. Uh, more and more, we're seeing whether it's uh, the foundation or whether it's businesses that have to somehow ensure that proper succession planning is in place to ensure, you know, the future and sustainability, et cetera. Are there any secrets you can share uh, on what you've learned about that whole multi generational? Uh, you know, component that has to be in place to ensure uh, longevity. I no, I'm probably not going to come up with any any secrets here. Um, but I, I think um, you know, it's as I, I've shared, we're in transition. We're handing off. It's really about communication. You know, we are uh, we are the members of TFF, but we also have NTFRI. I'm using acronyms here in TFC, but we also have board of directors as well at those three organizations. And it's it, communications, everything. Um, that, that is so important. And, I, and I'm really happy where we are right now in our space with, with the three organizations and, and how they're working together as well. Um, so we have some, some really great Terry Foxers and the fact that we meet regularly, we communicate regularly is, uh, is key to success, I think. September 18th, 42 years. Is that what we're talking? 42. 42 years. This quote, I would love for you to interpret this quote from your own perspective, your own knowledge and experience. I know that you can do the impossible. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can do the impossible. I mean, whenever I ride my bike, I'm thinking how quickly I can get up that hill or or down that road. It's, um, you know, I, I think we can raise $38 million in, in Canada. Like, I know that we can cure cancer. Like that's, that's the, that's the impossible that Terry wanted to focus on. And that's where I am. And I know it can be done if we all, and that's what Terry said, you know, I'm sure if we all tried, we could cure cancer. We're all trying. I mean, we're, but there's more we can do. There's more effort. There's, there's more money. Unfortunately, it is all about money. But if you look at where we are now, relative to where we were in 1980, we've come a long way. Like if Terry were diagnosed with cancer today, 
there's a good chance he wouldn't have had his leg amputated and there's a really good chance he wouldn't have died. Like that's really powerful for me. Can't change history. I cannot change what happened in 1981 when Terry passed away. But I know with every loony and tuning we raise today, we're saving lives in the future. So anything is possible. It is possible. Before we wrap up, what is one question that anyone in a leadership position needs to be asking right now? How are you communicating with your team? You know, I, I, what, one of the things that I, I am a little leery of as we grow and get bigger is, is ensuring that that team and that family aspect is, is maintained. And once you get layers of leadership, how is that how is how is that communication passed down and it's something that um i'm leery of and we as a family are are going to be keeping our eyes on as we grow and get bigger is making sure that communication and everyone is felt to be important and working together and working in the same direction daryl if you'll permit me this final question how do you daryl fox want to be remembered <laughs> I don't I have no I have no ambition to be I have no ambition to be remembered um, that um, that I was Terry's brother and I tried my best that's all well you've uh, more than tried your best and uh, you've you've uh, done your brother and the entire Fox family proud with sharing this story I know it's a story you share virtually on a daily basis, Daryl, and we can't thank you enough for stopping by and, and uh, adding to the understanding, a deeper understanding of the legacy of uh, Terry Fox. Great. Thanks, Gare. Enjoyed it immensely. Daryl Fox, <laughs> except for the age <laughs> thing. Yes. <laughs> well, you and I somehow are going to try and reverse the aging <laughs> process through this year. But uh, thank you again, uh, as Daryl Fox joins us. And what a profound statement, $1 for every Canadian. It was true back in 1980. It might be truer than true today. The leadership legacy of Terry Fox. What are your thoughts? If you want to share uh, perspectives um, on, on, on what Daryl had to say, feel free. We've got uh, a dedicated email uh, now for that purpose. It's called podcast at techtec-canada.com. Really enjoyed uh, Daryl Fox and uh, again, uh, sharing uh, his insights on a story that's timeless and likely more needed than ever. Um, and don't forget, uh, we always say this, but uh, if you have a chance to share this uh, podcast, share the link, share it in your uh, within your network, your social circles. Let's do every little bit that we can as Canadians to make that $38 million goal a reality, September 18th, 2022. And who knows, just by the, the act of sharing, you might inspire someone else to grab a hold of the throttle in this new frontier, and, and maybe they too will be inspired to do the impossible. On behalf of Stephen Christofferson, Alexander, Kat, Mark, everyone at the Tech Canada uh, offices in Calgary, Alberta. This is Gary Maxwell thanking you for joining us here on the Leadership Standard. <laughs>